Hey, my name is Greg. I work at Carta. I'm an information security manager there. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a bit about our experience with queuing mechanisms and how we, we had to make the decision between build versus buy. Uh, so this is Carta. We, if you haven't heard of us, we uh, help private and public companies and investors manage their equity, uh, cap tables, valuations, and investments and equity plans. So you can imagine from two founders in a garage all the way up to you know, thousands of people, public companies, we're helping people manage their stock, uh, you know, uh, selling it through tender offers, getting valuations, all that, all that jazz. Uh, so the reason we do that is because we want to create more owners. You know, the vision we have is imagine a whole world where every single person that works for a company uh, gets ownership in that company at some, some level. And we want to make it as easy as possible for that and, uh, and push people over the edge to go take that leap as an employer to, to create more owners. Um, yeah, so we, we were founded in 2012 uh, with three people. You know, now we're seven offices. It's more like 500 people now. Uh, I wrote this slide deck like three weeks ago. Uh, and then 10,000 subscription customers, 700,000 shareholders. Uh, sorry, extra zero there. Uh, and these are some of our customers that we really love to serve. Um, but yeah, so the reason I'm giving you all this context, and it will come up, is because uh, every technology decision we make now has to be read back to uh, our, core, our core competencies and our, and our mission. Um, so the reason I mention that is because we, we have a core competency and we want to make sure we focus on that. Uh, and the, our core competency is moving financial technology problems from the physical to the digital and solving them. Uh, so if you've ever heard the talk, We Are Software People by Twilio's CEO, uh, we kind of follow that principle. Of like Once you get something into the digital, you can do so much more with it. Um, and so we can solve really awesome problems uh, you know, with, with technology as long as it goes from you know, paper certificates and Excel spreadsheets into our, our web platform. So uh, we had this problem where we were going from monolith to microservices, age-old problem. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. Uh, and so we were starting to break apart our monolith. But because we're a fintech company, we have this uh, auditing system that is very, uh, you know, it's really needed. And it's also highly, it has to be highly available. And we can't drop a single transaction. And so we had to maintain that auditing system, which at the time was implemented as a connection between our monolithic database and some sort of auditing database. And it was just a, a tie right there using Postgres replication, if you're uh, familiar. And we needed to move from something that was, that was like centralized into that into more of like an event stream or uh, publishing events on, on some sort of bus. And then we would pull it and put it into, into the uh, audit system. And so we had that, that constraint. And we also um, were working towards cloud, being cloud agnostic in case we needed like a warm backup in GCP or multiple regions or things like that. Um, and we're also designing for hypergrowth. We've been in hypergrowth for years now. And it really does a number on you. So there's a lot of this talk that actually goes into what that actually means from a technology standpoint when, you, when you're trying to design for hypergrowth. So we, this is the order. Uh, we tried to learn from the order or the wisdom of others, and we ordered our, our priorities in this way. Uh, but we also tried to learn from the wisdom of others, and we were like, there's absolutely no way we're the first person to have this event problem. Uh, let's go learn from everyone else. And so we learned that LinkedIn had the same problem many years ago, and they, uh, they moved to Kafka. I think they actually wrote Kafka. But uh, they moved to this model, and we were like, OK, brilliant. This solves all of our problems. It architects for what we can foresee of five years of technology problems. Let's move towards this architecture. Um, so we started evaluating uh, message buses. And so we looked at three, Kafka, SQS, and, and RabbitMQ, because they were the most highly recommended ones at the time. So this is about a year and a half, two years ago. So these, you know, these technologies have changed quite a bit, and they evolve. Um, but you know, none of our, none, nobody in the company had experience with Kafka, so that was kind of a, a minus. Uh, maintenance of Kafka, we heard, was kind of a bear because of ZooKeeper. And if you're having more servers to manage the servers you're trying to manage, we thought that was kind of a lot of over operational overhead. So we are like, maintenance isn't that great, but it is cloud agnostic. And the performance was just bonkers. We were looking at that and going, like, there's no way we're ever going to need that, that many events. So we were just saying, OK, top notch for Kafka. Uh, RabbitMQ was similar, except for uh, the famous last word you'll hear earlier is, uh, I set it up. It's bulletproof. I've never had to touch it in my last companies. Um, so none of us had experience with that tool either. But maintenance was good, according to the research we did and the people we had talked to. Uh, and it was also cloud agnostic. And still, you know, even though it wasn't as performant as Kafka, it was still way more than we would ever need. Uh, maybe not ever, but for the foreseeable future. So uh, then we looked at Amazon SQS. You know, still no experience with it across the company. Uh, the maintenance was great, right? You just Amazon handles all the servers. You don't have to do a damn thing. It's great. So uh, cloud agnostic, though, definitely not. But 
one of the great things is it's still way more performant than we needed. So we looked at these trade-offs. Uh, and also a note on performance, though. Uh, if anyone's ever tried to evaluate the performance of a queuing mechanism, you know that it is like more complicated than AI sometimes. So uh, there's a white paper we read as an example. But there are so many facets to, to queuing that when you talk about performance, that it was just impossible for us to quantify. So when I say top and more than we need, I'm just summarizing because there's, there's so much. So if you read this white paper, you'll get a taste of the many hours we spent trying to figure out the best technology. Um, but we ended up looking at SQS as like, this is, this is bonkers cheap for a, for a queuing mechanism. And we were, we were really impressed. But the thing was, we thought that we needed cloud agnostic more than we did. And so we underestimated the need for uh, yeah, other, other constraints, but we were optimizing more for cloud agnosticism than we needed, uh, and underestimated the value of not having to manage any of these servers ourselves. So we looked at Kafka. It's like crazy fast. Zookeeper is a little bit annoying. We talked about this earlier. But it was cloud agnostic. And RabbitMQ is great because there's a middle ground, right? Kafka takes a lot of maintenance. RabbitMQ is apparently bulletproof. Uh, and we were just paying for the Rabbit nodes, not everything around it to keep it going, like Zookeeper. Uh, and it was still way more than we needed. So we went with RabbitMQ. We're like, huzzah. There we go. We solved it. Let's create some servers. Let's configure them. We set up some consumers, set up the producers, and we were off to the races. We uh, built so many new microservices on top of this. It was great. Um, yeah, it was, it was a victory. Six months later, we had this new requirement. Because we're a FinTech company, so people, you know, even though we're a relatively young company, uh, we have enterprise customers, and they have enterprise questions. And especially as FinTech, we're moving you know, millions of dollars uh, through our pipes. And so people are like, hey, do you patch your servers? We said, yes. Uh, can you prove that you do that on a regular, consistent basis? And we were saying, OK, you know, we can and we will, but it's much easier to prove to you if we do regular-based patching. It's like time-based patching, like every month or week or day, uh, as opposed to whenever we get like a, uh, an alert that something we have is vulnerable. Uh, and so one of the things about patching, if anyone's ever had to deal with that, uh, you have to reboot servers. Rebooting servers is a kiss of death when it comes to availability, uh, because you have to have some sort of like pool and manage everything like that. And RabbitMQ did not handle that the best in the way that we had set it up in a, its HA format. Uh, and so we had to go back and say, well, now the maintenance has gone from good to, to not as great. Um, and we still didn't have much more experience, because you know, if it is bulletproof and you never have to touch it, you don't actually have more experience with it. You just set it up and forgot about it. So uh, not much more experience. So we looked at Amazon again, and we were like, OK, it's Amazon. Like Everything in Amazon is kind of smells like Amazon. You can kind of pick it up pretty quickly if you know anything about Amazon. Uh, and maintenance is still just as good. Uh, but one of the crazy things that happens is that it got better over time. Uh, so what we learned was you know, all major tools are great at something or many things. Uh, whenever someone's like, oh, yeah, React sucks, or like, oh, yeah, this tool is great, um, always take that with a grain of salt. Everything is good at something. Uh, and we've, we've learned, like, RabbitMQ was good at something. We never had to touch it. But if you have to touch it, it may not be the best thing. Uh, HashiCorp Vault has been great when it comes to the actual technology of storing secrets. But when it comes to sealing and unsealing and the automation of all those things when you have to patch it, not as great. Uh, and Rancher is the one we use for Docker orchestration. Similar idea, a lot of trade-offs in that way. And so we went back and we said, hey, how can AWS help us better with this? And we found that a lot of the time they provide better trade-offs uh, because we were we were evaluating things the wrong way. And you know, also, one of the amazing things about Amazon is that it seems to get better at an accelerating rate. I mean, when I was evaluating SQS a couple years ago, I, you know, I don't even know if it had the exactly once delivery or how good its throughput was, the latencies. But I do remember being surprised when I researched it again how fast they had evolved. Uh, and that was amazing. I mean, I've never seen a company that has the gall to say unlimited throughput. Like, that's, that's insane. That's, that's a huge claim. And obviously, Amazon is big enough to do that. Uh, and so we were, we were saying, OK, we're going we're gonna to go in on, on Amazon. This is an amazing technology. Let's try it. And there's always trade-offs. You know, if you come talk to me afterwards, you probably say, SQS has you know, some latencies aren't as good as Kafka, all these things. Totally agree with you. But for our use cases, this was far more than we needed. Uh, so we, we went back and said, hey, what other build versus buy decisions are we making, and how can we leverage a buy better? Uh, and you might be thinking, wow, you know, you're going to spend a lot of money on SaaS now if you're going to keep buying everything instead of building it. Uh, but what we realized is we were miscalculating the value of designing for hypergrowth. Um, you know, I think that as a, start, as a startup, everyone knows, like, yeah, we're going to you know, grow a lot. That means that we're going to be bursting at the seams. But until you live through it, I'm not sure everyone learns the lesson of, like, uh, when you're one person, you start three years ago, and you're tripling every year, you're going to have, like, nine people under you uh, at the end of three years. And if you have 
uh, one problem at the beginning of three years, you're going to have nine problems at the end of three years. Uh, and so a lot of the time, you have to, to really think like, am I designing for hypergrowth? Because hypergrowth, when you're in it, is the most important thing to keep going. Because as soon as you come out of hypergrowth, the compounding rules of growth start to, start to die off. And so every technology decision has to be thought of as, uh, as a part of the business. And so when we talked about this, we started to reformulate it and teach our engineers, like, the job of everyone here is to keep hypergrowth going without being you know, irresponsible. So the job of everyone in a startup undergoing hypergrowth is designed in anticipation of future hypergrowth. And what we learned was if we, can, if we can set up Amazon once, we don't have to patch it. That means that you know, me as a, as a DevOps manager, I spent a month uh, setting up all these different systems and tooling around my, our previous queuing system. Uh, I could have spent a month building out a whole new uh, infrastructure around a new product, right? And if I enter a new product space a year earlier or even a month earlier, the compounding rate of growth because you entered a month earlier is insane over time. And so you start to see the business trade-offs in a technology decision like this. And so we, we went back and said, OK, we need to buy our way out of these problems when, when we can. Because if you have the money and you are hyper-growthing, uh, you know, it is our opinion that it is, it is better to buy uh, than it is to build a lot of the time. Because our core competency has nothing to do with queuing systems, right? To go back to that, we're trying to create more owners. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to solve financial technology problems uh, that have never been solved before. You know, a lot of our engineering is devoted towards a lot of the software development side because that's where the leverage is. And so our goal is to, is to help them as much as possible to keep building amazing things. So anything we can do to, to get clutter out of the way and operational overhead out of the way and move into a space of just rapidly being able to iterate, uh, we're, we're, we're being good technologists and good decision makers when it comes to technology. So yeah, so the cost of not designing for hypergrowth means that you're, you're not designing things that are going to solve your core problems or accomplish your mission. So that's, that's kind of what we learned. So thank you very much for your time.